Awesome. When I so when I pitched this talk a million years ago in October, you know the feeling. Um, I did not have to tell you that it might include discussion of sexist harassment, of racism, of immigrant intimidation. I didn't have to tell you that I will include no graphic images and I'll blink the screen when it's time. And it's totally okay to mute me if you need to. Instead, the talk I had planned started with a simple question. You see, to me, this is a UX question, except it goes by another name. And the word user is a bit sterile, so let's replace it. Um, and instead of calling it experience, let's call it living, because after all, we're not having a collection of experiences, we're having lives. But human still feels wrong, so let's replace it with something else. Um, to be human is to be social. Therefore, we're not merely a plurality of persons, we are a people. Now let's improve the grammar a bit. And you know, people still feels wrong. Let's try another word. Yeah, there we go. UX, to me, has never been about an individual's experience in a vacuum. Our experiences are framed through socialization in our communities. And so for me, we're back to the roots of UX, anthropology, the study of communities and their people. And this is the fundamental belief that sort of underlined my session from last year, where I started with these questions. We, de we deconstructed three examples in tech to get to this question. We took a trip through the socioeconomic, cultural, and regulatory stack that lets us through our work as technologists. We talked about how our phones and iPads contributed to modern slavery in the Congo and toxic lakes in Mongolia. We talked. We even talked about how recycling centers, one of the most championed tools of environment, environmental responsibility, can contribute to the marginalization of Black communities here in the U.S. And how power kept us keeps us ignorant to make us complicit. How mainstream environmentalism in the West often ignores the marginalized groups that are most affected by climate change. I talked about how our roles as designers and technologists in fixing that problem, but I didn't go much into details. And a lot has happened in the last year. From Australia to the UK to the US to Europe, it feels like democracy is fraying. And so as white nationalism continues rising, climate change kind of feels a bit abstract. But when the US election happened, this is what I saw. Because on November 8th, roughly 25.4% of the U.S. population likely condemned the entire world to at least a three degree increase in global surface temperature. Without federal movement, no amount of server efficiencies, electric cars, or energy behavior shaping design will ever offset the amount of fossil fuel drilling or community killing policies of Donald Trump's energy agenda. And if inaction continues, my political science spidey sense tells me that it's going to get worse. Because one thing you learn in political history and political psychology is that scarcity and uncertainty creates and empowers dictators and demagogues. And as ecological catast catastrophe hits more and more ecosystems and climate refugees become normality, basic resources are going to become more scarce. So as a political philosopher who works in tech, ask myself what went wrong. In a world where three degrees centigrade is likely inevitable, where do we put our energies? What can we as designers do? Are there any paths out of this? What went, oh, oh no. You see, when I saw these pieces on how Facebook's trending news was pushing outright lies into people's news feeds, I was reminded of this piece. There's a wealth of research that says that the first thing we read on a subject is set as true in our minds by default, especially when it matches our worldview. And then any evidence to the contrary has sort of a boomerang effect that reinforces the false belief. So when you have a content algorithm that reinforces the echo chamber and outright lies, 
you have a civic space that's constantly filled with falsehoods. And when it comes to political decision making, reality is secondary to perception. Even when people are doing well, are safe, and are thriving, if they perceive the world they are in is falling apart, we make decisions accordingly. So when I see these political lies on Facebook and connect them to three degrees centigrade, I see New Orleans still rebuilding. And this is where I tell you it's okay to mute me for a few moments. I'll bring the screen back up when, when it's safe. Because I remember white environmentalists in, lar in the largest nonprofits telling me that it's too hard to partner with environmental groups from marginalized communities. That creating programs to galvanize those with the most at stake isn't financially sustainable. I see Trump saying that climate change is a hoax perpetuated by China as lead, but the fact check doesn't happen until paragraphs later. I see hateful attacks on my Muslim friends, my immigrant family, my trans friends, deportations in the middle of the night in the UK, deportations in the middle of the, in the, middle of the day in the US. I see Twitter full of people with chronic illnesses and parents of children with disabilities worrying about medical care, school access. I remember getting on a bus to go speak on social justice. And a man in the back yells, go back to China. His friends laugh and no one defends me. I think about the water protectors in North Dakota being treated like animals, their connection to the outside world jammed. All this to create a world of fear and hate. I think about the Marshall Islands sinking below the sea. I think about black children drinking lead tainted water. I see white men writing articles about how we must come together while my family is bleeding. What we have here is failure to communicate. What we have here is the foundation of democracy crumbling. And yes, I work in tech, but I studied, I studied as a political philosopher. And I'm telling you right now, the stakes are in fact this high. This is not a drill. Western democracy is on a path to collapse, but there's hope. So before we talk about solutions and our role as designers, I want to think about what democracy is and what makes it worthwhile. Oh, shit. That was very much a scholar thing to do, wasn't it? Don't worry. Don't go away. It'll be useful, I promise. So here we go. Several thousand years of democratic theory in five minutes. The Sanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy calls democracy this. To put it in less academic terms, democracy is where people come together and make decisions. And this immediately raises the question, so what is even worthwhile? And some of us might scoff at that question, right? And yet, 25.4% of the voting age population of the United States voted for an authoritarian. Not only that, they consciously voted for an authoritarian. Another 44.7% were either unable to vote or more likely didn't bother to vote. So why bother is a question a lot of people asked with, I can't or don't. And people keep saying that government is so efficient. Having one strong, strong man make all the decisions is a good way to speed it up. But the world is complicated. A small group of, is deeply limited in how much information they can parse, even if they're perfectly moral, even if they are perfectly well-intentioned. One reason we need democracy is that everyone has a different perspective and different needs. That one person's great decision is devastating to another. So the legitimacy of those decisions requires everyone's input. So democracy is about the legitimacy of the decisions that affect the body pol politic. It is about us having a say in the rules that govern us to make sure our cares, needs, and interests are considered and cared for. Let me say that again. Democracy is about legitimacy, not efficiency, not about choosing one person to make all the decisions to get the job done. It's about consent. So what makes democracy sick? Folks in the US will, will probably know the Tree of Liberty quote from Thomas Jefferson, but do all, do all y'all know the full context? He was talking about British propaganda during the Revolutionary War, how tyranny always perpetuates lies, how ignorance creates complacency and is anathema to democracy and healthy society. 
And the only way to fight that is through popular, popular education and truth. So I think about research in political psychology, how our political ideology even makes it hard for us to do math when it's around politically charged topics and simple math, like adding and subtracting. How when we see people suffer under inequality, we're often more likely to blame them than confront the truth that the world is unjust. And how we, when we feel uninformed, we're more likely to avoid it than educate ourselves. And these falsehoods and bullshit are only part of what makes democracy sick. Through them, bad decisions are made. And the tools that we've built, Facebook, Twitter, and all the rest, those are the tools that made it happen. So when civic engagement is facile and our voice ineffectual and our survival isn't at stake, it's natural that we spend our limited attention elsewhere, that we pay attention to problems that we have the power to change. When civic engagement is simplified into a few votes on a ballot, it's natural that we look for shortcuts for making decisions, that we, that we concentrate on the quick outrage rather than the deep policy. So if we are to rebuild a healthy democracy, we need to design a system where people are empowered to use that knowledge so it's what worthwhile to be well informed. So what does this have to do with UX and design? Well, IKEA, one of the biggest proponents for democratic design, calls it design for everyone. And they'll say they do it by providing choice, lowering the cost of home products so they're affordable, and that's fantastic. Choices provide some amount of agency. But there's an inherent problem with this understanding of democratic design. Choice is like oxygen. It's necessary for survival, but it's not enough for living. The IKEA model of democratic design is oversimplified. It becomes about lowering the barrier to access, which isn't what democracy is about. In creating the tools that lower barriers to entry and emphasize engagement, we have created tools that empower the loudest voices, but not the ones we need to hear most. We've expanded access, but not democratized it. The most marginalized communities are the ones who are most hurt by climate change, and, we and yet we technologists are building little to help them, even as we fawn over self-driving electric cars and solar panel roof tiles. So this is a problem, and we need to fix it. Democratic design needs to be about bringing in the underserved voices. It needs, about, it needs to be about expanding equity, not just equality. Letting everyone join Twitter easily is equality, Making sure we protect the people who are most commonly experiencing harassment is equity. The founders saw that when the body politic grew ignorant, we could fall under the spell of demagogues and tyrants. But they saw no way to sufficiently and enduringly create an educated population. And that's one of the reasons they created the Electoral College and the Senate. It's a lot more complicated, but that's one of the main reasons. So we call the vote the epitome of democracy because that's how Western founders of democracy framed it. But what if it isn't? What if it's only the cornerstone? During the mid-aughts, Taiwan needed to update its national health system. At the time, public interest in government was at an all-time low, and we know how the U.S. passes ma major health care reform. A bunch of Congress people and the president get together, put, put something together, and they try to convince a lot of legislators, a lot of other legislators. Um, convincing the public is mostly an ancillary consideration, which is why despite major success many years later, on the eve of its repeal, most of the public loves it, but they're still confused about what the Affordable Care Act is. What Taiwan did was different. They put together a task force of public health, uh, health officials, academics, and policymakers, and they collected a huge amount of public health data. And then they went into the communities and started holding forums. They invited activists, they invited public health officials, they invited citizens, not just to listen to speakers, but to look at the data taught them to analyze it, and then asked them to give feedback about what they cared about, what needed to change. And then they took that information, went back to the legislators, 
and then use that to make policy. And now Taiwan's national healthcare system is considered one of the best in the world, both by patient satisfaction and people in public health. And this sort of participatory governance happens locally as well. So another story, a developer wanted to build a new property on a underutilized park block in a Taipei neighborhood. As an aside, Taipei has roughly the same population density as New York City. So as part of the planning, the public commissioner put up signs next to the park, put in ads and newspapers to try to tell the to tell the neighborhood about, about what was happening and invite them to public forums. Nobody responded or attended, so the plan went ahead. Right before demolition, when they're starting to bring in, bring in equipment, a student was walking home and noticed that they were stirring something. She asked the neighbors, they knew nothing about it. She called the public commissioner, and then she organized all the neighbors to protest. Within, within the week, they halted, they halted demolition and started holding new forums. So as anyone who has done community organizing can tell you, even on your best days, not all attempts at organizing people works. You can try your damnedest to do your dil due diligence, but oftentimes no one pays attention, which reminds me of a different example here in the US. When the Standing Rock protesters were gaining public attention last year, backers of the pipeline started putting out a lot of ads in opposition. One that was all over YouTube said that Standing Rock protesters said they were never consulted, this is untrue, et cetera, et cetera. They use that as the justification for why the pipeline should continue. You didn't say anything before, so now you have no choice in the matter is not only that straight up the language of abuse, it's also a gross misunderstanding of consent. When, and it completely overlooks the fact that marginalized communities are usually intentionally ignored, that attempts to consult with them are often structured in a way that silences them. So back in Taiwan, through new public forums, they discovered the reason people didn't use the park was because they didn't have the facilities people wanted. So the developer, the, the, the neighbors, and the commissioner put together a new plan. They got grant, federal grants to, to update the park with new, with new equipment. And the developer still was able to build a building with, with public commercial space to help bring life to the neighborhood. After the renovation was complete, people were using it daily. So the important point here isn't that public outcry is critical, though it is. The really important point is that Taiwan's political culture is such that when there's new public interest, there are systems of practice to stop and reconsider. Rather than say, you didn't follow procedure, Therefore, you forfeit your voice. Because in the West, we've sort of developed a dangerous conceit that the functions of government should be efficient above all else. And it's an idea that we sort of import from capitalism. But government and democracy aren't about efficiency. Government is about efficacy. Democracy is about legitimacy. Dedication to real substantive public input is necessary for that legitimacy. Efficiency is in service of those, not the other way around. Now, this isn't to say that just by creating public education task force forces or having, having tools for public engagement will automatically make government more legitimate. While Taiwan was reforming its, its health insurance program, a lot of activists didn't trust it and refused to participate. It's through repeated practice and repeated engagement that these systems gain the public trust. As someone's grandmother always said, you only gain trust through trusting others. And Taiwan's work here continues to evolve. A few years ago, one of Taiwan's ministers went to a civic hackathon and asked them to build and find, let me make sure I get this right, digital tools that could facilitate accessible and substantive civic participation civic participation at scale. Words we really like in tech, at scale, scalable engagement, awesome. So they decided to build a tool called vTaiwan using a system called Polis, P-O-L dot I-S, which is built by a team in Seattle. In Polis, anyone can ask a question and everyone else can answer yes, no, pass. 
through that, they can find out where there are groups of consensus and points of disagreement in real time. And the way vTaiwan works is really amazing. And already it's been used to create substantive policy and reshape healthy political dialogue in measurable ways. So a real thing that happened, Taiwan had been considering laws for selling booze online for about six years. It's taking that long because there is deadlock in both public rhetoric and in the legislature. On one side was their version of Mothers Against Drunk Driving who were against it because they didn't want an increase of public drunkenness. On the other was the liquor lobby saying that the lack of online sales was bad for business. To give you an idea how V Taiwan works, two statements were put in. One, we cannot have an increase in public drunk driving. Over 75% of people agreed. Two, we need to have online liquor sales. Again, over 75% of people agreed. Tens of thousands of people participated in this, and they agreed with both sides. They realized that the deadlock was a false dichotomy based in political rhetoric. After putting the issue through Taiwan, they passed legislation in three months. Let me repeat that. Six years of political deadlock broken in three months because citizens were given the chance to substantively contribute to the policy discussion. This is a show called Talk to Taiwan. Most of it exists as Facebook live streams, where a journalist will sit down with a policymaker or an expert and have a live interview. They'll have a conversation around an issue that's going through, going through um, the legislature or whatever, and they'll respond to the chat. But they don't just respond to the comments section on Facebook. They also use polis. So they can build citizen coalitions and mandates live on stream. This isn't merely journalism for, for telling us the voice of political leaders. This is journalism as a bridge for, for creating citizen-informed policy. This is democracy that can only happen through digital mediation. So to come back to the US, the majority of us care about sustainability and climate change, yet we have few avenues to affect either government or corporate policy around the issue. But concentrating on the tech is dangerous. Yes, the digital tool is important. But for Taiwan, there was buy-in from the highest levels of government right from the beginning. The digital tools are an augmentation of an established political culture. They have a history of doing it, and that's powerfully important. We can't just build the technology and hope all the problems of governance are, are solved. And by the way, what you're seeing on screen now is in fact the GitHub repo for Canada's digital services team. They're talking about building deliberative practices into Canadian government right now. So if you're Canadian, go contribute, because it's really exciting. The technology is only part of the process. In Taiwan, they used it to find what issues need focus. Through the public question and answer process, they build agendas for committee meetings where stakeholders have to build consensus. The meetings are in person with policymakers, lobbyists, citizens, activists, whoever has a stake. And it's live streamed for public viewing. If there's deadlock around an issue, they push it off for, um, they push it off for reconsideration later. Draft policy is only only created around where there is unanimous agreement. And then the draft is put back into V Taiwan for another round of questions and answers from the public to build the agenda for the next meeting. And the next meeting. And the next meeting. Y'all, is this sounding familiar? Because it is to me. The current government has already said that the plan is all substantive national policy has to go through a process like this and all the government ministries already have initiatives to do the same thing. Already this process has been used to create completely new regulation on huge issues like, like closed companies, which are their version of what we in the US would call a Delaware LLC, and car sharing services like Uber. And it's easy to say this is interesting, but impractical to bring here to the West. I know because a lot of my professional policy friends have told me this already. 
But this sort of thing is already happening in the US and in the West. Participatory budgeting is the most common form of deliberative democracy practiced in the US and a lot of places. And Tishara Jones is the Democratic candidate for mayor in St. Louis, and she plans to make it a reality. It's happening all over the US, many places in Canada, Brazil, Portugal, France, Italy, Germany, Spain. It's happening everywhere. It's part of the core platform for the movement for Black Lives. And if you watch the protests, they often practice forms of direct democracy on the streets. Black leaders and activists have always been way ahead of mainstream America here. So this is possible. What we have to do is find officials who want to make it happen. And if you can't find one, demand it. And if they still won't listen, vote for someone who will. Or even better, run for office yourself. If the federal government is unwilling to do anything, concentrate on your local government, on your state government. Build it from the ground up. The core of sustainability work in UX and design can't just be about the products we make. It has to be about the way we make them. It has to be about involving our communities. Let me give you an example. In July, I was part of a project called Letters for Black Lives. It was immediately after police had killed Alton Sterling and Philando Castile. Christina Shi, a digital ethnographer who works out of New York, wanted to write a letter to her parents about anti-Blackness in Asian American families and hoped a few friends would join her in writing it in a Google Doc. In a matter of hours, there are hundreds of people contributing. The English version was finished that night with edits from more than 100, possibly more than 200 people. Within 24 hours, there were a dozen translation teams translating and rewriting the English letter for their particular cultural history. Chinese, Hmong, Hindi, Urdu, Farsi. A Rutgers professor started one for Afri African immigrants. A Latinx team started one. A Canadian team started one for, for Asian Canadians. Each letter was speaking directly to their community's experiences and fight for social justice. And because, of, because I'm a nerdy tech person, the Korean translation team had more than a dozen people working on it. They, in the Google Doc, they created a voting system to translate words and phrases and paragraphs. And if you're a project manager, this is one of the most beautiful examples of organic collective decision making I've ever seen. And the letter got picked up in national, international, and local media. It started Thursday morning. On Sunday, there were over a dozen people at Wired's offices in San Francisco making a recording of themselves reading the letter. By Monday, when we launched, there were a dozen finished translations and more than a dozen in the works. Hundreds of volunteers across the world. The Google Docs were crashing with how many people were trying to view and contribute. But more important than that, the letter got picked up in ethnic community media. The Korean text was published in Korean papers all over the country. A few weeks later, NPR Code Switch did a podcast episode where I cried when I was listening. The World Journal, the largest Chinese language newspaper in the United States, created a six-page feature about the letter and the history of Asian Black solidarity and clashes, all in Chinese. But that wasn't the amazing bit. You see, people started making their own recordings in their own languages. We started hearing stories of siblings sharing the letter with each other and saying, let's sit down and talk to mom and dad about this after dinner. Overnight, hundreds of people came together to create something that was measurably shifting the conversation for social justice in our communities and at the dinner table. And none of us could have done this alone, but together we create something to empower ourselves to go to our families and have hard conversations. And similar projects are popping up everywhere now. People are crowdsourcing collective call-in sheets, documenting and tracking protests that they can join, or how you can call your representative. One of my favorite is a bunch of librarians starting a library of resistance. And it's on 
Goodreads and WorldCat now because librarians are beautiful, beautiful people. So look at your own work, look at your projects, look at your clients. Are you building products and telling people how to use them? Or are you building products that empower people to self-actualize? Are your client websites for them to talk to people or with people? How are you taking feedback from your customers and constituents? How do you turn that feedback into meaningful change? The Brookings Institute has six conditions for making deliberative democracy work. I kind of compressed them into four. The first is about the neighborhood park and Standing Rock examples. How do you make sure the people who have a stake in a decision give their input? not only have a chance to give their input, but are actively engaged throughout the entire process. Second, this is about the Health Insurance Task Force. Good decisions come from good information. How do we gather the necessary data and educate stakeholders to analyze and understand the information so they can better contribute? Third, when Taiwan was starting their experiments in deliberative democracy, a lot of people were deeply skeptical. There were no direct avenues where their, in, where their input at a community forum would be shaping actual policy. But now the government believes that every major piece of policy that must go through that goes through the legislature go, go through the legislature must go through public comment. Fourth. One of the first things Obama's White House implemented when he entered office was We the People, which allowed anyone to create a petition and if it gathered enough signatures would receive an official response from the White House. This was a huge move in giving people a direct voice in government. But because it didn't require any action, it was less effective in creating real change. But because what happens in V Taiwan creates binding results to tell legislatures how to write policy, people see their input ha have direct impact on the laws that govern them. This creates trust, which encourages people to participate more, which means they have incentive to learn more, which means they can contribute more. In his farewell, Barack Obama said that we have to sit down with our neighbors and family and convince them that we must rebuild a healthy civic culture. And this is core to deliberative democracy, that the, it is the core to our jobs as creators of community experiences. We are the ones making the tools and the spaces in which people talk and interact. That's why the experience our, our tech allows matters just as much, if not more, than the code we use to build them. Last year, Science Magazine published a study showing that volunteer canvassers going door to door uh, to talk about the rights of transgender and non-binary folk could successfully change strangers' minds after a 10-minute conversation. These conversations work, and they work a whole lot better than ads and think pieces and Facebook posts and whatever else. So make spaces for people to tell each other stories. This is what we need to be designing for, because it's the storytellers who reshape society. We want to concentrate on the trash fire, but the ones at the top are merely the leaders. While strong, they can do nothing without followers. It is always the ordinary people who carry out the inhumane act. So as I'm watching news about the ICE raids and the airport customs agents here in the US, the, the Dakota Access Private Security, I'm thinking about both the Stanford prison and Milgram experiments. Ordinary, ordinary people who, because of authority tells them to, carry out horrifying acts because that's their job. But then I also think about the World War I Christmas truth, truce where despite fighting a war against each other, once opposing troops broke bread together and sang together and played together, they refused to fight. And I think about the difference. And the difference is they knew each other's stories. So as I think about the call-ins and global protests of the last month, with Congress people turning off their phones or sneaking away from town hall meetings, 
I remember my time on the Hill, where the CRM that most of them used was built around a few specific things, recording your name and address, topic of the comment, and the rest was a process for responding by form letter. And I got to wondering, what if our representatives weren't just voted in to make legislation? What if their CRM wasn't just about responding with form letters? What if they had tools to help take public input as core to how they shape legislation? What if each of, the, each of them was more of a moderator to help us find consensus with each other through a system like B Taiwan? What if we created new spaces for collaboration where people aren't just yelling at each other, but understanding one another? When democracy starts fraying, you don't compromise with the fascists in a gamble to save what's left. That is a false hope that ends in total ruin. When democracy starts fraying, you double the fuck down on democracy. But it is increasingly apparent that we can't pin our hopes on the established political or intellectual leaders to make it happen themselves. And even though our political theorists have been talking about participatory democracy for decades, they join projects like the Open Government Partnership to help the rest of the world make their governments more deliberative because they see no way around the institutional inertia here in the West. So it is up to us. It is our job to demand our governments become more deliberative. And this is how we raise the voice of the water protector above the oil baron. This is how we raise the voice of the immigrant against the Nazi. This is how we raise your voice. And the black kid in the South Side, and the trans girl in North Carolina, and the single mother, and the steel worker. This is how we bring up the everyday voices that we all need to hear most above the well-dressed fascist or the dapper neo-Nazi. Neo it's through that work we rebuild healthy democracy and stave off the con artists and the charlatans. It is through that work that we create the space that raises the voices most vulnerable to climate change. And changing, completely changing the form and function of Western democracy, that's hard work, y'all. Like I said last year, this is a radical reimagining of society. But the alternative of continuing down the path we're on right now, hoping that democracy somehow muddles through, that's not sustainable. But we, when we sit down to hear each other's stories, we understand each other more and we love one another more. We take each other's stories and make them a part of our own. That's how we make ourselves a people. So go, demand better democracy, find the storytellers, run for office, tell your story, make spaces for others to tell theirs so we can build a new civic of love and joy. My friends, don't stop telling stories.